the next session that we have, and we indeed we were wondering why we got so greedy and we gave so little time to all of this stuff. I guess it is because we wanted to be able to cover as many different aspects of both the writing process, publishing, and also funding as we possibly could. And this is the result. We have to rush a little bit. So the next session we have is an open access facts, strengths, and weaknesses. And uh, we're very pleased to welcome here two people who really know what they're talking about, looking at publishing and open access developments from different angles. And uh, both of them are going to hold a presentation. They say that it's going to be around 10 minutes, which will leave us again some time for discussion. And with everyone's consent, taking advantage of the prerogatives of the chair, um, I suggest that we continue until around five after. So if you can manage to hold your lunch until that, that gives us enough time to cover this session. And the first speaker, I'm very pleased to welcome Lena Kakinen, who uh, is with Gaudiamus and Helsinki University Press. So please, Lena, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, okay. So I'm uh, publishing director, Lena Kakinen, from Helsinki University Press, and also Gaudiamus. And I would like to tell you a bit about Helsinki University Press and uh, open access. Sorry? So, um, Helsinki University Press is an open access university press uh, and it's open for scholars both in Finland and abroad. And uh, of course the background institution is the University of Helsinki. And the management of our operations is, is shared between Gaudeamus Publishing, which is an uh, academic and non-fiction publisher in Finnish also owned by the University of Helsinki, and also uh, Helsinki University Library. And that means we have the combination of expertise of a professional, experienced academic publisher and an academic library. And I think that is an advantage for us because we have, uh, the library knows about a lot about discoverability, uh, uh, metadata, indexing, and all things that are very important for electronic open access publications. Also, we are a, m a member of uh, uh, a network of open ac access university presses. Uh, our partners are like Stockholm University Press, London School of Economic Press, Open Library of Humanities, and White Rose University Press. A lot of uh, British other uh, university presses and uh, also from abroad and we can there share our experiences on this uh, open access publishing, which is uh, a true spirit of open access uh, to share the experiences and uh, in this way to uh, advance uh, open access and uh, how, to, how it could uh, best serve uh, researchers. And our aim is to maintain quality, not to make profit. And we, the quality means that we have, uh, for example, strict peer review, and our de decisions are made by our academic board that consists of 12 members, and you can see uh, the members on our web page. Uh, if you are interested, we publish monographs, edited volumes, and journals. Uh, but we have uh, uh, started uh, quite recently, so we are only preparing our first publications now. We haven't published anything yet, but uh, the first publications will appear this year. The publications will be mostly, but not exclusively, in English, and all the publications will be free to download on the internet in PDF and HTML format, but also they will be available to uh, purchase as e-books or in print, so you can pr uh, buy the book in print on print on d in demand edition, and that will be uh, a normal book, pr book price. Uh, so we also have give the opportunity to uh, establish book series with their own editorial boards, and we al already have some plans for that. Uh, they will be in the human and social sciences. Uh, and we like cross-disciplinarity. Uh, we favor publications that are comprehensible for uh, a wider scholarly audience. 
And I, I think that is also what uh, this collegium is about, this cro cross disciplinarity. And as I said, we really focus on quality in peer review and also in copy editing and book and journal design as well. So, why? <laughs> why is a new university press needed? Why, why, do we, uh, why did we decide to establish Helsinki University Press? Well, uh, I think Sami is go, uh, later going to talk about the open access, the uh, pros and cons, uh, but we, we really think that uh, nowadays the scholarly publications uh, publishing faces many problems. Uh, publications are behind pay walls and uh, universities pay a lot of money to uh, buy the publications, uh, the journal packages and book, books and it's really uh, at the huge costs and it doesn't really uh, help the universities but the money will go, uh, it goes to the pockets of investors. And uh, I think we also have a dissemination problem, so uh, the uh, publications are not as widely read at, as they could, and uh, open access could be a solution for that. And we want to provide a good quality publishing service to researchers and give the control uh, uh, to researchers and not to the big companies. And we want, uh, that's why we really want to listen to researchers when we are developing our services and listen uh, to the ne their needs. And so we are really open to discussions and we welcome you also. Uh, we would like to hear your opinions as well. And of course, we want to disseminate uh, research widely. And nowadays there is a, uh, I already mentioned uh, a bit, there is a kind of movement especially in Britain, Britain, but also across the world, to establish uh, university presses to, uh, so that the universities uh, gain control of the publishing, uh, because now, it, now the big publishing companies have the control and it doesn't really work uh, to the benefit of the universities. So universities want to take this publishing into their own hands. This is also what this university press is and open access is about. But there are still many stereotypes about the pure quality of open access pub publishing. But I think uh, open access publisher can be just as uh, good as any other press. It's also all a question of how the peer review is done, how the other work, the editorial work is done, and we are going to do that as well as any other, uh, as very, very well. And so we, we would like to work against these stereotypes as well as other presses. So um, I really think that new uh, channels uh, are needed there are not so many uh, open access channels yet, and we, so this is why we need Helsinki University Press and other open access university press to provide high quality open access publishing channels. And what we hope from you, we of course we hope uh, we have uh, ideas for possible publications for us monographs and edited volumes. And if you know about, uh, for example, an out of print distinguished uh, scholarly publication that uh, would be very nice if it would be published again as an open access publication, please let us know and we, can, we will see what we can do about it. Also, we will uh, hope for feedback, ideas, points of views and open discussion with, with you and good, good cooperation. And here you can see our web page. It's very simple, uh, the address, so you can uh, go and look for uh, more information. And feel free to contact me anytime with your ideas. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Lena.
for that. Um, and then again, we'll postpone questions for the debate. Uh, now we welcome Sami Suryamaki, the head of publishing with the Finnish Federation of Learned Societies, and also someone who has quite a bit of experience uh, of scholarly publishing from the side of being a scholar himself. So I look forward to your presentation as well. Hello. Uh, <coughs> Uh, nice, to, nice to see you all, all here. Um, yes, I am Sami Suryamäki and, and working at the Federation of Finnish Learned Societies. Um, I would like to start from a more general point of view. I mean, uh, in my opinion, we are living in a transition period now when uh, open science or open access publishing is sort of dealt with these kind of presentations that tell you about open access publishing. I'm quite certain that within uh, several years uh, it will become a part of so-called so normal science in, in, in Kuhnian sense when you just talk about publishing and everything that is included there. M many of the practices that are, you know, um, Sort of bubbling there on the on the surface today will will become part of normal of normal normal uh, scientific practices. I'm, I'm sure, though there might be something that will not become some uh, will will not become a part of normal science. Um, I'm guess many of you know quite a lot already about open science, or open publishing. What I mean, the simplest way to put it, put what is open access. Is, is that, I mean, it, it means that uh, text will be available for anybody who has got an internet access somewhere in the world and for free that you can read. That is the simple definition, definition for that. So, so it means that actually um, uh, block text without, an, without pay, pay for it's an open access publication. But of course you are not that interested here about that or maybe, maybe after the first session you are. Uh, but uh, we here think more about the peer-reviewed articles. And, 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 and the first remark here is that when you say an article is open access, it, well, it means that it, it is open for many, many people to, to read, but uh, there are some kind of codes or categories for the degrees of open access. Uh, these do not necessarily touch so much about the research as it depends on your funding and so on. But, but <coughs> there is a something called green open access, which means that uh, uh, preprint or, or post print in some cases will be uh, put in a repository and maybe have an embargo or may, may, maybe not. Then there is a gold, which means that the author has to pay for the publisher to open the article. You pay pay the, those uh, big publishing house so that they will op open that for everybody to read. Otherwise, they they it, it will not be open, and people will have to pay to read that. Uh, and there's a platinum where the um, APCs, these are article processing costs, uh, are charged are not charged from the author. They may be paid by a consortium or, or, or getting funding from foundations or. Or, or the texts are published by a non-profit organization that does not take fee from, from anybody. They just uh, try to organize it. So they're publishing that way. Um, sometimes when discussing these matters, actually quite often you hear this. What is the point of open access when researchers are not interested since they already got access to the research articles via their institutes. And it's quite tempting to, to think, think this way. But uh, if you think a bit, bit more, you will notice that not everybody actually has. I mean, if, if you go to third world universities, it's, it's, they don't necessarily have the same uh, access that you have here in, in Helsinki or, or wherever you are coming from. And there are also differences be 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 between research institutions and researchers. So these are the, uh, some general words. And we'll, uh, I was asked to give a presentation about uh, pros and cons 
of open access from researchers' point of view, and I have a few of both. Though basically, I will already mention that I, I think there are no no cons if you publish an open access articles. If you if you really think about it, about you know, the, the from the point of view of, of, of research. So. Um, Lena somewhat touched this subject already. Uh, currently, the amount of open access journals or open access publishers of monographs uh, is lower than the number of traditional journals. So you may find it a bit difficult to find where to publish your work if you want to publish it in, in, in open access. Uh, and the number of uh, this varies quite a lot between dif different disciplines. And of course, the problem there is also, it's a real problem, though uh, it might be exaggerated, that you have got these predatory journals, which means that since it is quite uh, cheap to establish uh, a journal in an e-format, you don't have to print it and, and not to take care of that kind of cost. So it means that there are some, some uh, villains around there that established this journal with the solely the idea that they will collect APCs, uh, the article uh, processing uh, cost from you and just publish and no real peer review and so on is done. There is uh, something called DOAG, which is a directory of open access journals, and they are trying to keep a list of those open access journals that really are not predatory. But it's also, they, they have some difficulties that, you know, I, I mean, if one paper gets there, a journal gets there on the list, what might happen? Somebody buys it and then, <laughs> then move, move the business the other way around again. So, so it's, it's, but it's, I think it's, 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 a, it's a real problem, but uh, not, not that big actually, because I, I mean, you, when you, when you, learn that you have to publish in, in, in certain journals, you will know, spot those journals if you use your, just uh, think about it for a while. Don't trust those journals that send you emails and say, hey, we heard about your research, we would like to, you to do the publish in our journal. It's quite simple in that sense. Uh, then there is this quest, quest, question, uh, if, 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 if you are an early career researcher, it's, this question is often ra raised that uh, may I not publish in nature or, or somewhere since I would like to get my career going and publish in those kind of journals which are not normally open access. <coughs> there is an answer to that also. Uh, I, I know in, in, in some countries it really matters where you publish to, to advance your career, but uh, for example, the plan is, so called plan S uh, is. Do you hear me if I speak like this? <laughs> okay, so uh, plan S is uh, raising up the uh, raising up this DORA declaration of research assessment, and they say that you, you should not assess uh, researchers their work from where they have published, but you should actually take a look what they have published and, and take a look at the text. And also in, in Finland, you I know that there is this um, misbehavior by universities that they are using this so-called U4, U4 classification or ranking of journals to, to assess uh, researchers when they apply a position at the university. But it clearly states that you should not do that. So uh, I do understand that some people get stressed over that, but it's something that at least in Finland you should not have that stress since this is not how you should uh, assess the research of, of individual researchers when they apply for example positions and so on. Lena also I think touched this slightly. Uh, there is a conservative scientific pu publication culture. I mean, I mean universities can be radical but they also you know at the same time you, you may find them extremely conservative in, in, in some aspects. So. Uh, Open access publishing is, is, is not appreciated by academics. It's often due misunderstandings, but, but there is still some kind of ide ideas going around that if you 
publish open access, it's not even peer reviewed or or <coughs> people will get, get all, all, all the rights for your text and so on, you may not have those. But, but I mean, this is something that is changing, I'm sure. But this is real. I mean, depending on the model, green, golden, platinum, or something else, there are plenty of other metals too, <laughs> too in, in these categories, but uh, you may need to have money to publish that open access. And, and if you don't have funding, that's then a problem. But then again, we come to the uh, market of open access publishing, as I already mentioned. Not all journals uh, take these APCs, uh, and some take lower and some take higher. So it's, it's not necessarily a, 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 a problem for you. Pros are more visibility, more hits uh, and clicks, efficient pu uh, public dissemination. I your your um, articles will be easy to use in teaching because they are for free, everybody, everywhere. Uh, and it also has got a potentially uh, higher social impact since also, also uh, the people who do politics or, or make decisions can reach those easily. This has been studied, even up to 600% increase in citation or citations or, or refer references compared to uh, those traditionally published articles. Uh, there are certain re uh, individual research projects on this, but also also some, some of the publishers have, have tried to uh, see what happens with the different journals, and, and they all, all refer to this. Uh, that it will increase the citations or references to your article. And it also will be uh, much easier for yourself to, <laughs> to refer to your work. I mean, you, you will may end up in, in, a, in a web of references from this article to this and this and this and this. And it, if you're involved in a discussion, so you may just put the URL there and say it's, it's there or in CV so everybody can read your articles articles uh, easily and, and see what you have been doing. And you do get, if people actually, if, if open access publishing <laughs> is, is uh, going to be, be the normal way of doing things, you do actually have, have got the access to all the published research. You don't, I mean, Helsinki University ha doesn't have got access to all the journals and, and depending on your discipline or your luck, they may or may not have access to that. And then you have to find other ways. But if it's open access, you, you Will have, you will ha have an access to the journal you need. And, and, and this is, um, it's, it's not necessarily a, a principally a cons uh, about open access. It, it, it could happen in any uh, e-format publication, but, but for some reason it seems that in many cases the publication process is much faster in open access publications than, than the traditional, especially if you convert to the print ones, because that takes time also. <laughs> Ten minutes, yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. Thanks a lot. Um, and now, we are well set for a discussion, and uh, we do have a nice 15 minutes almost. And um, I see Jane, and then here, apologies, I don't know your name, maybe you can introduce yourself, and let me just uh, distribute the microphones. Jane, may, why don't you get started while we set this up? Okay, so thanks very much to both of you for those really interesting and helpful talks. And maybe Lena, Lena can start first, um, but both of you I'd like to hear from really about the funding model for open access in Helsinki University Press, but also more generally. I mean, you've told us, but I, I think it is really a, such a fundamental issue, isn't it? And um, 
I think that it's made light of, perhaps, in many discussions. You have addressed it, but really it's quite a serious, I mean, the people who work as editors and copy editors and do all the kind of technical graphics and so forth really need to be properly paid and so forth. So I think that's a concern that I have as an academic. Thank you. Yes, um, this is really, uh, this is true. Uh. And we, um, we have decided we will not, uh, we are uh, very much in favor of the uh, platinum model that uh, I really think that open access should be institutionally funded. Uh, that's, uh, uh, and it, uh, I think the pro nowadays when uh, many journals have the APCs that the author pays, I think that is very, uh, that is really a big, big problem. As Sami said, that uh, the researchers are in a very unequal position. Because some, uh, some researchers have good funding uh, that they have, um, they have the possibility to use their funding for the APCs, uh, but some researchers don't have this possibility. So uh, that I that is a very, um, very uh, big problem that must be solved institutionally. And uh, well, I'm very happy because we have uh, behind us we have this big institution, <laughs> University of Helsinki, but. Uh, I think uh, we also need uh, wider solutions on national and even on European level uh, that we really need to address this problem. Because if, the, uh, if we want open access, then uh, it, it, it is not, uh, even though it's free to download on the internet, it doesn't mean that it's free. <laughs> it doesn't uh, cost anything, of course. You have to pay for the editors or uh, the, um, um, well, you have to properly, and also for the desi graphic designers, and, and, and there are other costs, and the cost of uh, organizing a peer review, and, uh, and other uh, uh, people use their uh, time for that. And so uh, we really need it. it. It must be solved institutionally. Uh, I think that's very important. Thank you, Sami. Yes, um, it's very important that the solution will be sustainable. We don't want to <laughs> destroy journals or publishing houses. <laughs> there are people who, who like to do a little bit of that, but then we should uh, ma make difference or see, see the difference be between the big uh, international publishing houses and, 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 and smaller national level of publishing uh, societies or, or publishing houses that are not, you know, big profit organizations. Uh, well, <coughs> elsewhere, for example, uh, 2017 had a profit margin of, does anybody here know? Tina? Yes, 37%, which is, I mean, it's incredible. And, and the prices for the universities to these big deals have been raising all the time. So, so, so one could imagine that there <coughs> could be a solution that would be sustainable for both for the universities, researchers, and also elsewhere, if they would just go down a little bit from the <laughs> profit margin, which they will not do uh, on a voluntary basis. So we need some kind of uh, tools to say that we, or, or the university library should be allowed to say no for the big deals so so that they could try to get these deals. We, Finland has got it spring, for example, uh, sustainable deals nowadays. It's, it's not impossible to do that. Uh, on the other hand, we have got this smaller uh, pub publishing, uh, national uh, publishing houses or, or uh, um, scientific societies. And in Finland, we have an ongoing project that is trying to find a way, a sustainable way, way for, for the Finnish journals to become open access journals so that it would be fun funded by a consortium of, of, of universities <coughs> and some, some other uh, research institutes and so, so on. So it's an important question and, and we just hope that we will find a, a way, a 
sustainable way, way to go open access. It's, uh, both are a bit difficult questions, but I, I'm sure that one day we'll find these solutions. Thanks. I'll take more questions. I'll just add, we had the one. I'll add quickly. I am. Um, I think that what the, the issue of money is indeed crucial, and um, it is outrageous when we really consider that these large international publishing houses they are enormous, and they are making making enormous profits for any sector. And it becomes all the more outrageous when you think about it that this is public knowledge, as we heard Janis Arakivi mentioned in the previous presentation, mostly done by taxpayer money, which is to. Some summarize the fact that not only is it done on the basis of public funds, you could think that taxes are intended to be for things which are for general use. It's a public good. And the fact that these you know, international publishing houses are able to translate that into a private commodity from which you can make astronomical profits is outrageous. And if you really think about it, even without considering the reality that many people are putting in their free labor, and if you happen to have a university position, you have a salary from that, you still will not be getting a separate paycheck to do the copy editing work, which is really hard work. But especially when you don't have an academic position, which increasingly is the case when 75% of academics are in situations of precarity, many people are likely to be without proper funding, it becomes all the more outrageous. And it just seems that we really do need to be radical and revolutionary here, because I don't see in any way how, any way how we can justify that profit margin to be considered as public uh, a private uh, um, uh, profit or private um, property. I think the only working solution that we have and we need is to be able to take that money back to the academic community, back to the taxpayers, back to the scholars, either to pay for this unpaid labor or to utilize it as further research grants so that people can do more research, or then some other ways to disseminate the knowledge for the benefit of the taxpayers who have paid it in the first place. I'm very vehement on this, realizing that in the US context, higher education is a different matter. It's largely a private matter. Here, it's a very strong speech for the European model of, of public universities, which I think is, is really, really important. Um, the question there, I, I, I imagine uh, this might yeah. give you yeah. some th thought you want to comment okay. quickly and then we'll move on to the question. Yes, uh, yes, um, I think that is uh, true what you said. And the sad thing is that the taxpayers' money, uh, uh, universities are funded by taxpayers' money, and that money go, uh, goes to these uh, international publishers which means it goes actually to the uh, investors, uh, the, the private uh, yeah. people, and <laughs> they can, <laughs> well, to uh, put it bluntly, they can buy their fine, uh, nice cars and things like that. And it doesn't really, really uh, help the universities and research. So the money uh, should really uh, be uh, put to the uh, taken back to the universities to help the research. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I mean, uh, somebody put it quite nicely that um, I mean, for the last 20 years we have been incredibly approaching a point where the universities don't actually offer <laughs> to have access to the research they've done. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, many scholars, you will find that you write something yourself and you do not have, have access to it. So you concretely lose the access, not only the intellectual property right, you will no longer have access. If, you, if you're not employed by university, you cannot afford to read your own work. How outrageous is that? I mean, we really do need a revolution. So then please, you have the blue, blue box there. Yes, thank you um, for your presentation since this interesting discussion. I have a, my name is Nanne Sukvartin, and I have a very concrete question from the perspective of a doctoral student. Does the University of Helsinki have, uh, does it have uh, some kind of rules or guidelines um, about including open access articles in an article-based dissertation uh, that are peer-reviewed, of course, but like, do they have any rules? And if, if it's okay to include those, who pays? You already pit touched this issue, but uh, who pays the doctoral student or the faculty? Or? Um, there some, might be some people that are in better position to answer this, but I know that, that when I was still working at the University of Health in Helsinki, it was required actually I don't know how many of uh, the researchers knew that, that you should uh, save one of, one of the copies to repository. So, or, so it should be in, in this screen open access. 
it's a requirement here actually. How many of you knew that? <laughs> Not some, some, some of you. Yeah, so, so it's a requirement. Uh, the question concerning uh, who pays if you JPCs, you need to have a project that will pay, pay that or otherwise it won't be paid or published in such a journal that uh, is, is not taking your APCs from you. I mean, the thing about uh, open access, there is a weird thing that we are in a very un uh, sustainable situation right now where scholars are made to be in uh, infringement of their copyright agreements with publishers if they try and, and, and have their publications available. However, you are not in infringement if you publish or download it in a, a private website or a back search. So it's really complicated and problematic that you are borderline. If you <coughs> are not in academia, for example, that can be considered an infringement of your uh, publication contract. If you publish it on your personal website or the website of an association, that doesn't necessarily count. So we do actually have to introduce it to the academic community if it takes part of the way. Now, um, we have your promise in the back and then we have Greg. Do you know something about how the publication thing is done, Thomas? Do you want to add to that? Uh, I, I want to be the devil's advocate. Okay, there's, if you don't mind, we have a few people who have been having their hands up and I think I'm going to try to be bold now. Now it's not the time to be, to be spoiled. Okay. okay, one and then we have two and then we have three. Is that okay? So one there and then, sorry, there in the middle. Do you, do you have a hand? Yes, one, one, two and three. Thomas, can you hold on to being a devil's advocate for a sec? Hi, thank you. This is a very important discussion, but I, I think that uh, one a uh, crucial uh, dimension of this is the funding of universities. You know, uh, universities are funded by, uh, in the basis of completed degrees and uh, the quality of publications. So, uh, as this uh, current state of open access, how, how it is related to these kind of quality requirements of, uh, you know, as being a publication uh, in in the terms of uh, university funding, I, if it's if it's left outside from that box, I think this this is a very difficult position. Yeah. Okay. Um, yes, there is an obvious problem there. Uh, as I as I mentioned, the the top level uh, in, in in different kind of. Uh, Rankings, the top level journals. There are less less open access journals there than, than in general and than other kind of journals. That is a problem, of course. Uh, so that is, that is a problem that concerns the uh, uh, university fund funding. But uh, the new model actually adds twenty percent uh, to all open access publications. So it is there all already take, taken partly uh, considered. But it, yeah. Okay, uh, thank you for the discussion. I have a, like a quick practical question concerning the requirement that the University of Helsinki has to uh, for the green open access. Um, um, is it correct that I, uh, I have understood that if, if you have your uh, uh, journal article accepted and then you upload it to Tuhat, then it, it is automatically uh, saved to the university database. So it, this is the way how you can meet those requirements for the green open access. <laughs> Just by saving it to maybe hard. somebody else here, here here could answer this question I mean, I mean not, not if you if, if you just add, add the text uh, or bibliographical information to hot share certainly it will not be taken care of you need to upload the text somewhere you have some ideas on that well, if if I well I if, if I understood correctly what you were saying um, 
well, uh, for, in, for instance, one of my texts was uh, accepted in journal uh, in July, and it will be published <coughs> in the near future. It takes some time before it comes out. And so I, I sent my text to Tuhat. So I, I wrote the title, and it's accepted, and, and everything. And, and they will do the inv investigation. So if it's acceptable, if <coughs> what are the rules of the journal? Because not necessarily all the journals are green. And in my case, it wasn't. So actually, first, what they did, they uploaded the text, but then they took it away, because it, it was not uh, the green policy that the journal was following. So I still need to wait until the, my text gets really public. Even if it's accepted unconditionally, um, I need to wait until it's published. Well, preprint. Pre uh, well, actually, uh, Tuhat doesn't really like preprint versions because it's before <coughs> the peer review. So I understood. You're not. Do you want to add something to this? Because I think what we're seeing is that um, the system is quite chaotic. Yeah, it's it's very difficult. But uh, well, when I was well going through guidelines, I understood that Tuhat well prefers the uh, versions after peer review. Yeah. We have Santeri there. Do you want to comment on this? And then we'll uh, give Thomas the floor to be the devil's advocate. And again, it looks like you might have the final word. Does it sound okay? So as, as far as I understand, uh, you can applaud your pre-print version on Tuhat. And this is the version you own. I mean, it's, it's yours. So for example, if an article is published in a, in a journal which is not an open access journal. The pre-print review is still yours. You can always upload it on Tuhat and it will be an open access then. Before the peer review? Uh, no, 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 no. Before it is published, it's the last version you send to the journal. It is still yours. But the so proofs belong to the publisher already. So you can, is that the case? It's not the proof, it's not the proof. It's it's okay. pre-printed. I mean, before before those proofs, it's it's the typically it is uh, Microsoft Word version you sent. Uh, it and it is your final, the the one that you have on your computer. It is still yours, Thank so you, you can publish Santeri. it. This is really useful information. So go back and read the contract that you are signing when you publish something. You actually do get a contract. Read what it says and. No one to ask questions and no one to be silent. Lots of people are publishing their things in academia knowing that they technically are infringement with their copyright agreements, which is very, very pro problematic because you're really only trying to get your, your work out there. But what Santa is saying, just to summarize it, the last version after peer review that you submit to the journal, which identically should be you know, the, the exact same text that is going to be printed word for word, that is still yours. However, it is not the <coughs> proofs. So the proofs are the ones when the copy editor goes through the final draft and corrects all the tiny little details that are wrong. That belongs to the publisher already. Does it make sense? OK, OK. They first uploaded the version. Because I, well, I didn't have the courage to do it myself, so I do what takes care of it. And they first uploaded it. it it's the word version. Uh, put as a PDF. So I'm not sure what you said is actually, it's, well, <laughs> I thought about, well, I, yeah, because I, after reading, you can go to, through the guidelines in Tuhat, and as far as I understood, it preprint is before the peer review, but no, you can check it. It's not true. <laughs> okay, but they took it away anyway, the, the version. Oh, they, they made the mistake. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you have to also realize that there may be people who don't know what they're doing, so be insistent. <laughs> and, you know, even if they think that they're in the right, and if you can get your way to, to prevail, you are the one who wins. And uh, this is seriously an important lesson. Don't expect everyone to give you everything. Be determined, know where, where you want to go. And if need be, sorry, everyone block your ears, um, push the boundaries a little bit, because when there's blurry terrain, we're really on a good mission, and I realize I have a background in international law as well, so I really should not be saying this. I'm a docent in international law, for God's sakes. But the lawyers always know that you know the rules are only there for you to, to get around them. So we are on a good mission. You only want to get your work out there. Know when to ask questions, and know when not to ask questions, and try to get it out there in some way. And now, Thomas, you want to play the devil's advocate, and I think, oh, sorry, we have Anna still. Do you want to go? Um, okay. 
I just wanted to, because uh, uh, there's also the, the university library has the agreement with publishers to that the university pays the APC. For example, I did that, um, but I also n I also then think that it's kind of then I have again the university pay this huge amount of money to the publisher, and it's kind of still it goes to this private profit thing. Uh, but for example, in my case at the time, I was not I didn't have a contract with the university, and I wasn't uh, getting an office or anything. So I kind of thought it's <laughs> I can have the university pay this, but this is also an option if you want. So I don't know, I don't remember now what were the criteria for the publications. This was with Taylor and Francis. Thank you, that's really useful And several useful colleagues yeah. have done that so as well. We had yeah. someone from the library explain this deal to us that we should take advantage of. Very it. good, so you can always try, try and be. And now time for the devil's advocate. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, if you have things you want to add after this, please let's do so over lunch, okay? Yeah. So Thomas, please. So, so there are two issues here, one is the um, access to information that uh, that been discussed that that problem can be um, mended by publishing the pre uh, print uh, article uh, through open access then the second is the profit and the the uh, huge um, sums of money that the universities and public institutions pay to the private companies but um, that point number one is that the question is what is the alternative added added value. So we pay a lot of money to computers and software and other private companies. They make you profits. When should we th think that universities develop their own computers and software in, instead of? So that's equivalent to that. And, 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 and point two here is that many of the journals um, are owned by um, professional scientific associations. And some of the uh, profit will be, the revenues will be returned to the associations. And now the constructive, and, and therefore, they also profit from, from that system. But, um, and that's the main point then after that. Instead of putting pressure to individual researchers where they published, I think that if you want to um, make open access um, more um, um, a, a, a wide, widely shared practice, then you should pressure on the professional associations that they should move their journals from these, uh, these uh, private uh, publishing houses to an open access or somewhere where they do know that. They would lose some of the revenues, but that's where it should start before uh, more than the researchers moving to an uncertain terrain uh, of open access where they don't know whether that is actually has a status. That's much more slower that way. Thank you. Who wants to go first? Sami or Le Lena? And I, I suppose this is in the way of conclusion as well. That is uh, very true what Thomas said uh, about it. this shouldn't really be the problem of individual researchers. It should uh, start with those institutions, the societies. And uh, yes, I, I agree. And also, uh, of course, uh, it's true that when, when the publisher really wants to maintain the quality and wants to uh, uh, do its job really well. It has costs, and we have to remember that open access isn't uh, free. There is a lot of work that has to be paid. So this is why uh, it should be should be funded in uh, such a way that uh, it has uh, it can maintain very good quality. That is important, and often it, uh, of course. Of often we forgot, forget that quality publishers actually do a lot of work uh, to add value to the publications. So we also must remember that. Hmm. Yes, it's <coughs> very easy to agree that the individual publisher, uh, individual researcher should not be pressed too much. Um, but it comes to the, um, <coughs> for example, the scientific societies, uh, in, in Again, in, in Finland, they actually already doing that, never been a part of big business, ever, never actually. Uh, well, and there was actually a case, I don't recall the name of the journal, but uh, all the editors resigned because they were published by 
Elsevier and, and that was a protest against Elsevier and they, they started a new journal. But then again, it, it, it's not that easy necessarily because those big, big publishing houses do actually uh, provide good services for the journals. You, you get a lot of information and other kind of help. So you, it's a bit uh, tricky, tricky situation. So in, in my opinion, the best solution would be that you, you would be able to negotiate a sustainable uh, deal with those big publishers and they would remain. But we will see what happens. Thank you. I'm again abusing my powers as the chair. I actually think that we do have some keys to the solutions, but we need to be insistent and radical. And I think that here one of the big problems is in the transition from a, a common good to a private commodity, uh, we've given intellectual property right of our work to public, uh, private corporations, and I don't really see why we're doing that. And I think I agree in full. There, this is work. The, the work of a publishing house, the work of a copy editor, the work of a high quality online platform to showcase our work, that is work and that needs to be paid. However, why don't we as a, a scholarly community start treating that more insistently as a service that we buy? And what is not for sale is our intellectual property rights and our intellectual contribution, which needs to remain a public good. And that is the only way in which we can really maintain the dialogue with our scholarship and the society and problems of the world and today. So again, I'm sorry, I always, I mean, everything has to do with university crisis and it always gets me going. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sami and Lena. This was fantastic. Um, I'm really happy with how these two sessions work together with the first one and then the second one. Um, I feel like I learned a lot. I hope you feel the same way.